beautiful. How many of you all remember from your childhood singing songs like that in church? You know, the we, we some of us uh, more uh, rural people, I won't call us country folks, but one, some of us more rural people uh, remember singing songs like that and I'll fly away and uh, songs of heaven because we don't have this as our only home. We have this as our training ground for when we'll get home. And so as we continue with our study of the book of Acts, we're bringing it to a close. We're doing part 24 of the book of Acts today. Next week will be the last of the book of Acts. We'll wrap it all up before Veterans Day the week after that. And you'll notice we've continuing to have our walking stick here because as Paul roamed the Roman Empire, he walked most of the time and he was always trying to bring Jews and Gentiles to the love of Christ, showing the love of Christ and teaching the lessons of Christ. So today we're in chapters 25 and 26 and we are titling this lesson, Paul Gets Agrippa. And that's a double entendre for those of you all who speak French. And uh, he does get Agrippa. And we're going to see that. And we're going to also see the anti-trinity. So let's do something a little bit different. Normally I go to the scripture and I start reading it all the way through. Well, there's a lot in there and I know you've probably read it this week. So what I'm going to do is out rather than reading the rest of chapter 25, I am going to do a little bit of a summation of the verses. If you want to reference it in your uh, Bible, it's starting at chapter 25 of Acts from the 13th verse and I'm going to do from 13 through 22 I'm going to give just a little bit of review because we've got a lot to cover today rather than doing so much reading but as we start out if you'll just keep your finger there at that part of the scripture as we start out I want to relate this to us and you may remember that we've had this slide before. And it's a little complicated, but I'm going to break it down for you. So, all of us are born with a soul and a spirit. We have a soul and a spirit. And that soul and spirit is broken down in our persona as will, mind, and body. And as we grow... We have actions of our will, actions of our mind, and actions of our body that go back and forth, growing our soul and our spirit, or shrinking our soul and our spirit. And during all of this, we are integrating into God and God's ways, or we're not. We become justified through Christ and then the Holy Spirit comes in as our life architect and helps build our selves into the perfect person that God wants us to be in our lifetime here. So the Holy Spirit, if you've ever wondered, how do I get a mental grasp on what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is the holy architect of your life. That when you accept Christ, He comes into your life. He comes into your spirit and He boosts your soul and He gives you all of those things that an architect would give when building a house. And so, eventually, you grow 
in spirit with God through utilizing all of this that you've been given and are growing through and you realize God as your sovereign holy God from the Old Testament Jesus Christ who is now your mediator with God in everything having to do with your life and the Kairos Alpha Kairos means moments of impact in Greek moments of impact you have all of these moments of impact that happen and he's the alpha dog he's the alpha of those the first and foremost of those things that come from the trinity into your life as a christian so that's what this represents now here there is another thing that can happen and does happen to many many people if you're not integrating with God through life, you're disintegrating. You're disintegrating. If you're a non-Christian, your God is really yourself and others. And so, you have a bucket list. And it's okay to have a little bucket list as you're getting older of things that you might be able to do now that you've never been able to do before. But if you concentrate on yourself totally within that and then when you kick the bucket that'll be it and that's showing that the Jews and the power mongers back in the days of Acts that we're talking about their soul and spirit disintegrated to the point where they're no longer remembered not only on earth but they're not remembered in heaven either and so, John Ortberg tells us, in the end, the outer world fades. We are left with the inner world. It is what we will take with us. And so I admonish all of us to remember that we're either integrating into God as part of his family, or we as mind, body, and soul are disintegrating also in the book of Acts we've seen not only this apostle Paul but we've seen the apostle Peter and what's happened is the Sadducees and Pharisees that are in power they were in power and they were in power to stay in power they had their bucket list and they drew it down around themselves and what they could do to please God and please themselves. And they became small souls, but they were constantly wanting more and more power. They brought Peter and Paul in and charged them with contempt of court because they were talking about this Jesus that could change everything because Jesus is going to bring all people together in Christianity and they stifled free speech and we have some people today still that are trying to stifle free speech aren't they unless you're speaking exactly what they want to hear oh that's what they call Nazism right so we have Peter and Paul in this book of Acts who are the major characters that are talking about salvation found in no one else. And what they're saying is something that should be beautiful to the Jews. They're saying that this is, if this is Israel, Jesus came and topped it all off. He added, remember Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will be taken away from the law until everything be fulfilled. And he was talking about his sacrifice. He was saying, and Peter and Paul were saying, Judaism is not going away. It's going to be completed. It's going to be fulfilled through Jesus. And indeed it was. And if you remember old Theophilus, Theophilus is the judge that Paul is going to come before and Acts is the brief that the apostle or the uh, disciple Luke wrote down to defend Paul in Rome. And so we have to remember that 
Theophilus and the Romans feared any threat of violence because collegia or associations were illegal except for the Sanhedrin. Because why? Because the Jewish religion was accepted in Rome as an official religion. So as long as you stayed within the Jewish religion, then you could not be prosecuted because that was an accepted religion. And the Christians came along and said, we're part of the Jews, but we're completion of the Jews. And the Jews said, no, you're not. We're complete like we are. Christ isn't part of that because the Messiah has not come yet. See how that setup is for what we're about to do today. So we saw earlier last week that Felix left Paul under house arrest for two years. Paul, with this huge soul and spirit in connection with God, integrated together with him, is being kept prisoner by this disintegrating person and his so-called queen. And so that was last week, and we saw how wonderful it was that Paul could be kept in prison for two years, or at least under house arrest for two years, because it gave Luke time through the Holy Spirit's influence to go back and forth between Caesarea, where Paul was kept in captivity, and Luke had the light come on. Hey, I've got two years here where I can go back and forth within two to three days from Caesarea to Jerusalem and talk to all the people of the way and learn from Mary how things happened at the very beginning in Jesus' birth. Learn from the Apostle John that leaned on Christ's breast at the Last Supper. Learn from all of the documents that were there. Uh, James was still there. Peter was still there. The Pentecost Christians were still there. Many that were healed by Jesus were there. And on and on and on it went so that Luke had two years to build the case for Paul's innocence when they did eventually get to Rome, and it's called the books of Luke and Acts that we are just finishing up. So for those of you all who weren't here, I hope that's enough of a, a little bit of a review that we can all catch up together. So now we're going to summarize Acts 25, 13 through 27. Now let's remember, this is A.D. 59. A.D. 59. And so we are... When did Jesus go back to heaven, be ascended to the Father? Around, right about A.D. 30, scholars believe. A.D. 40, A.D. 50, A.D. 60. We're 29 years beyond that. The disciples, the apostles are getting old, but they're still around. And here comes Paul. He is being questioned. He's being ruled over and judged by a triumvirate. And Festus is the new Roman governor. He's come in to replace Felix. Felix was recalled back to Rome. And Festus, the new governor, comes in. And he's out to impress. You know, when you always get a new job, you really want to try and impress everybody, you know, at the beginning. And so he's trying to impress the powerful. And he doesn't want to make anybody mad. He wants to do the good governing thing according to Rome. And so he calls, he, he realizes that Agrippa II, who was king of Syria and that area of that day, and all the way down in a, in a, in a strip on either side of the Jordan River, he was in charge all the way down to the temple. He was in charge of what happened in the temple during those days. Herod Agrippa II, grandson of Herod the Great that we've heard so much about. And then Bernice, his queen, was with him there. So Paul is called in front of this triumvirate. And it's interesting. Let's look specifically at verse 18. Acts 25, 18. This is 
Festus talking. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with, in, with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss on how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. Interesting thing, in verse 8 he says his accusers did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. So I held him until I could send him him to Caesar in verse 21. It's very interesting that now if you look about the fact that Theophilus in Rome, who will be the judge over him, in over Paul in Rome, is now reading the court record. Because whenever they had this kind of a get-together, this kind of an event, it was recorded in duplicate. And one copy was kept wherever the trial was held, and another copy went to Rome for the official records. And so Theophilus is looking at this, and can you imagine being the judge and saying, hey, Festus, through the records that Felix kept, is saying that none of the things that they're talking about that Paul did was any crime against Rome. And so I didn't know what to do. What he should have done is just let set him free, but he didn't. So he held him till he could come to Caesar. Now you'll notice down at the bottom here I have a little note. The Greek word there in the text is not Caesar, but is sabastos. It means the emperor's court in Greek. The emperor's court, not Caesar himself. Caesar was far too busy and far too lazy to hold court over all of the things that were happening throughout the empire. And so Luke is telling us that he was held until he could come to the emperor's court and that court would decide his fate. Now, besides Festus, we have Agrippa II. Agrippa II was a great guy. Have you ever noticed known people who were just uh, so effervescent, so handsome, so outgoing, and, and, and as well he could be, he made the equivalent in those days of about $125,000 a year from the temple offerings and taxes and other monies he could get from his kingdom there as long as Rome got their cut. And so he was a king, king of the Jews at the time. He was a charmer. He was a puppet of Rome. And above all, he was selfish. And there are many Roman historians that write little footnotes at the time about Agrippa II. He was a great guy. Claudius Caesar loved to have him around because he was just a delight, a charmer. And then, of course, we have Bernice. Now, Bernice is unique in all of Scripture. Um, let's see her. This is an actual head of the Athenian statue to Bernice. There was actually a statue on Mars Hill where Paul went at one time, you may know, and he actually saw the statue to Bernice, which is where this head came from. She apparently lost her head some time ago. Um, and so Bernice, they've gone back and they've done a sort of a, a rendition of what she probably looked like based on some of the things they, that, that historians have told us about her and her bone structure. And this is sort of what she probably looked like. Now that's 
quite a beauty we can see from even that, isn't it? And don't we love a beauty? Hasn't God made women wonderful for both the eyes of men and women? And we, uh, we us guys, we uh, vote for that. Uh, but look, look, look at uh, Bernice. She was the sister of Agrippa the Second. Who's Agrippa the Second? This guy. She was first married to Philo's nephew, and Philo was an Alexandrian guru who was at the right hand of Caesar. And so they married her off young to Philo's uh, uh, nephew, and she couldn't take it, so she jilted him. And it's okay because lots of men were standing in line. And then she married her uncle because why? Rich always marry rich because keeps the money all in the family, right? So, she, after she jilted Philo's nephew, didn't divorce him. She just left. She just took off. She married her uncle and who had two sons by him. And then she became the incestuous queen of the Jews with her brother. And that is written about by four different historians of the first century. So, that's Bernice. But there's more. Let, we'll talk about what happened to them in a few minutes. But, the Trinity became involved and they provoked Herod Agrippa to say, hey, I want to hear from this man myself. He calls himself a Jew. He is a Jew. I'm the king of the Jews and I'm here. I'd like to hear this man myself. And so it gives Paul the opportunity to do what we've been calling the four P's. Having power, doing the persuasion, having persecution because of persuading people to come to Christ and then in spite of the persecution a progression for the church. So we're going to see that as Paul speaks to this triumvirate who's judging him. But I want to use a different picture. This is a different painting that's supposed to be a painting of that same thing, that same trial that happened when King Agrippa said, I would hear this man for myself. But I'm picturing for us here, it wasn't just for himself, was it? He had all these other courtiers. Forget about this triumvirate. They're probably never going to change. Their souls are so small that you could look at them through a keyhole and see the whole thing. And so we're not going to ever probably change them, even though God would always want to. And we're not going to change Paul. He's always going to be who Paul is going to be. So we kind of blanked out them as a quotient for this trial. And guess what? We got Luke over here. And Luke's sitting there taking all, taking mental notes about all this thing that, that happened. And so Paul is about to stand up and make lemonade out of these lemons. And all of these people that are going to hear are going to hear this Acts 26, 1 through 11. Now, Acts 26, 1 through 11, I won't read again for you, but it's all that rendition of Paul saying, hey, Herod Agrippa, I'm going to tell the whole story here as so short as I can. I was a company man. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I came along and I was ready to get rid of these Christians because they were against my people, the Jews, and they were talking uh, heresy that Jesus was the Messiah and came along. And then after I was a company man and was about persecuting these Christians wherever I could find them, that's Acts 26, 1 through 11. Then the thing we want to pay attention to is the fact that all these people are saying, hey, hey, how did this company man, including Theophilus later in Rome, how did this become something different? 
You see what God is doing here? God is allowing Paul to witness to a wide array of Jews and Gentiles and Agrippa is allowing it to happen. So now we're going to read new information and this is what I really wanted to center on today. New information from the road. What road are we talking about? The road to Damascus, right? This is Paul on the road to Damascus. Acts 26, 12 through 23. And we're going to read this. <clears throat> on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven First to those in Damascus, then those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead will proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. We'll stop there. So this is new information. We've heard Paul talk to different people, to the Sanhedrin, to the first court, all about his Damascus Road appearance. So you may be thinking, well, this is the third time we've heard this. Well, you're right. This is the third time we've heard this. But the Holy Spirit is not just repeating himself like somebody who's addled. He is giving us new information that if we care about it, if we care to know, we'll get in the know. First of all, no, in none of the other accounts does Paul say what Jesus said first. Jesus said first, after he told Paul who he was, he gives the first command I'm Jesus, stand up. You know, sometimes somebody needs to come to us and just say, you need to get a grip. You need to stand up. Stop cowering in the corner. And that's a good advice for us as Christians. And then in verse 16, he says, you're going to be my servant. He proved to him by his voice and his optics the word there in Greek is optasia, which means a, a real body that you can see, but up in the sky. And he says, you're going to be my servant. Now think about this. That Greek word in the original papyri that we have is huperetis. Huperetis means under rower, plural part of the language. What that means is, that Jesus is telling him, you're going to be an under rower down in the belly of the boat where slaves are that are pushing the galley along and you're going to be down there in the belly of the boat. Now, you know what? If I was Paul and I was on trial there before this great triumvirate that is going to decide what to do with me, you know, I just believe it would be bad PR for me to say, you know, Jesus called me a slave and an under rower, and that's what I'm going to be, and that's what I have been. You know, I'd, I'd say at least I was a 
corporal and not a private. I would be somebody other than a slave. But Paul is saying exactly like it was. You're going to be my slave and that's going to be okay. And in verse 19, it says what I just mentioned there. The Greek word for vision, I saw him in a vision. The Greek word is optasia, which means a vision that was body-like. Now, this is the key for all we're going to study today. And I want you to get this. We're going to go, go through it pretty quickly. But I want you to get it. In verse 17 and 18, if you're going to underline anything in your Bible or make a little star, this is the place for it. What Paul says is there are five things that Jesus told me that I was going to do and that I've been doing. And this is for all of us who are Christians. This is our little Reader's Digest roadmap of what we're supposed to be as Christians. The Kairos, in this moment of impact, Jesus comes to him specifically in body and he says, you're going to persecute all of my Christians? Well, guess what? You're going to be a servant and a slave of all of those Christians instead of their persecutor. You're going to witness to open their eyes. You're going to give them the chance of turning from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God for forgiveness of sins and becoming sanctified by faith in me. That is in that little passage of scripture, 17 and 18. Servant, witness, open their eyes from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. If you ever wanted to have put a little bookmark in your Bible for witnessing to others, all you have to do is tell this story. When Paul was on trial, he retold what happened when Jesus came to him and wanted him as a person in his community of faith. And he told him, that this is what you need to be doing if you're a Christian. These five things to everybody who's not a Christian. It's wonderful right here from the book of Acts. And so, it's the gospel. And that's what we as church should be giving to other people. This gospel in five easy points. And I believe you may have some of that in your bulletin. So, We'll finish it out with Acts 26, 24 through 32. Let me read. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so, what happened right there? What caused King Agrippa to stand up and walk out on Paul? Well, because when Paul said the final thing, he said, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. Well, Agrippa was a Jew. He had Pharisees and Sadducees right there in the courtroom in the audience. He had other Jews and that would get, the word would get back. If he said, I don't believe in the prophets, oh, that's really bad PR. But he said, if he did believe in the prophets, then 
What Paul was telling him about the prophets who prophesied about Jesus and was proving, if he answered yes, he did believe in the prophets, then he was on Paul's side and he was going to have to let Paul keep talking about Jesus. Well, it was a conundrum. And so he got up and left because he couldn't have a good answer. He had put himself in the way of perhaps becoming a Christian himself. So they got up and they left. But the church was able to progress because of all of these things, particularly Luke writing things down from this record. Now, what happened basically was, this is the McCormick Revised Version. I always like to point it out when I'm doing the McCormick Revised Version. Agrippa said, I've heard enough. Instead of me judging him, now he's judging me. He's, going, he's putting me in the witness stand. I can't have that in my courtroom. And so, what happened? Well, in short, Festus was recalled in AD 62 as incompetent. How many years is that from 59 to 62? He was governor for three years. Most of the governors were there from, you know, at least 7 to 10 to sometimes 11 years. Not him. In a as far as Agrippa is concerned, he ruled on from 59 to 67 AD. He ruled in Syria. And he was actually used by God to be kind to Christians who were being kicked out of Jerusalem once the fanatics finally took over all of Jerusalem. And he was then brought back in to Rome in AD 68 through 92 quite a few more years and he was kept in Rome and he stayed a bachelor for life he never did have an official queen he just had his sister as his queen and what happened to Bernice well the jilter became jilted as she got older in A.D. 68, which was less than a decade later, but when Agrippa was brought back to Rome and under Caesar's thumb, then she actually ruled as queen from there. And lots of mosaics that we have of the time, you may be able to point out, have Bernice with a tunic and trousers on. She took up the mantle as the king while Agrippa was gone for all those years. And she met Titus when he came through. You know, General Titus that destroyed Jerusalem. As he came through with his legions, he was all powerful. And uh, Vespasian, who was his father, was now acting as Caesar in Rome. She met Titus and became his mistress. He was 11, she was 11 years older than he. And in 73 AD, when Emperor Titus ascended to the throne from his father, Titus sent her away back to the east and say, Go away, kid, you bother me. You're getting a little old and long in the tooth now. And I don't need you. I'm now seeing your Caesar. So, what can we say to bring all this together? and end up today. Well, we went through all of this. The idea is everybody must choose. You must choose. Are you going to be integrated with God and others through what you do in your mind, will, and emotions and your spirit in this world? Or are you on the path and going to be on the path to disintegration with God. I encourage you to let the Holy Spirit architect spend some time in your life. Make those decisions that say, hey, I'm going to integrate with God and others so that I won't disintegrate. Next, we're going to finish things out with Paul's journey to Rome. And it's going to be a fast-paced journey next week that we're going to take. And it's going to have something that I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you have never heard or seen 
in the Bible before. If you have heard it or seen it before, then I'm going to give you your money back. <laughs> but they said this anti-trinity of the world, the flesh, and the devil said Paul would never be heard from again. We're not going to pass judgment. We're just going to ignore him. Well, he'll never be heard from again. Well, the Bible tells us that eventually the world, the flesh, and the devil will never be heard from again. So we don't want to be in that camp ever at all. Next week, we'll finish it out, part 25, Acts chapter 27 and 28, which is called Captain Paul and the 276 and the Brief End. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you've given us this great history lesson that we can learn from your word how Christians act, how Christians do what we do, why we do what we do, that we can be and are your people integrating into you through the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me?